Chairman, my fellow speakers, the Vice Chancellor, members of the academic staff, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. The title of my speech is National Languages Policy and Reconciliation. The language is the most cherished possession of mankind. It's the most distinctive feature that separates man from beast. But for language, we would still be among animals without a culture or a civilization. So language is a distinctive feature that distinguishes us from animals. It is not only an element of culture, but the most important element of culture because all other elements of culture depend on language. Nothing else could be done without language. The language is the most powerful medium of communication because the amount of information that can be transmitted by language is infinite. You can say almost anything if you know your language. There's no limit to the ideas, number of things you can say. Now, all these aspects highlight the positive contribution language has made to human civilization. However, there is one other aspect that makes language a bone of contention. This arises from the fact that language is also a symbol of cult ethnic identity. Sri Lankans are identified ethnically as Sinhalese or Tamils, not on any other criterion, but on the fact of their affiliation to either Sinhala or Tamil as their mother language. As such, language can lead to problems of unprecedented magnitude. Bangladesh, which was referred to in the morning, is an example, is an excellent example that showcases the importance of language as a symbol of ethnic identity. When Pakistan came into being, as a single nation, yet in two different geographical areas, one in the west and one in the east of the subcontinent, it was felt that Pakistan will prosper in peace and harmony, but that is not what happened. It was proved otherwise. Language was found to be stronger than religion of the two countries in two different places, had one common religion, but two different languages as mentioned in the morning, Urdu and Bangla. Religion is not a symbol of identity, of ethnic identity, but language is. Therefore, a new nation, Bangladesh, came into being because of language, although they both belong to the same religion. Sri Lanka was, is a nation that's on the verge of dividing itself into two on the basis of language. The declaration of Sinhala as the only official language in 1956 was a political move that made Tamils feel unhappy about the status given to their language. Of course, this was rectified in 1987 by an amendment to the constitution by making Tamil also an official language. Today, both Sinhala and Tamil share the status of an official language with English as the link language. Steps are now being taken to make Sri Lanka a trilingual nation. The president himself has presented a 10-year plan for a trilingual Sri Lanka, 2012 to 2022, so this is the copy I have, a 10-year national plan for a trilingual Sri Lanka, presented to cabinet and revised on the basis of cabinet decision on the 1st of February, 2012. Now in this, the president sets out the foundation for a national initiative to encourage the acquisition of trilingual skills and competencies by all citizens of this country 
by 2022. It also provides impetus for e the equal development and promotion of the two national languages in all spheres of life, with special focus on the revival of the culture of language learning. In order to implement this policy, the president, as mentioned by our chairman, has appointed a six-member committee called a Task Force for Trilingual Sri Lanka, with Mr. Larit Virdung himself as its chairman. Now, the composition of this task force is very balanced. Three Sinhalese, two Tamils, and a Muslim. Now, this task force is entrusted with guiding, supervising, and coordinating the activities of stakeholders to carry out proposed activities under the 10-year plan and review them periodically to prevent replication of work. Now, this task force, of which I'm also a member, will identify three distinct phases for the implementation, piloting, expansion, and consolidation. The first phase is spread over the first four years, the second over the next four years, and the final over the last two years. However, the success of the implementation of these activities will depend on many variables, and as such, activities earmarked for the first phase, first phase may be deferred to the second, and so on. Now, the first phase, called piloting, will involve a series of interrelated activities, such as the restructuring of language courses, the publication of new textbooks and other materials, the recruitment of language teachers, the training of trainers, the establishment of a national card of second language teachers, the establishment of a national card of language translators, and reforms in evaluation and examination. The second phase, expansion, will expand the activities initiated in the first phase. It will, for example, continue to recruit and train second language teachers in the three languages for all sectors of education, primary, secondary, tertiary, including public service officers at national and provincial levels. Then update databases of language teachers, enhance linkage or exchange program, produce new textbooks, compile trilingual dictionaries and glossaries of technical terms. The third phase, named consolidation, will involve social and cultural integration and reinforcing programs. Steps will be taken to document the progress of the trilingual initiative in the country for purpose of record, motivation of the public to participate in the trilingual initiative, reflection and lessons learned. This phase will also focus attention on the in induction of second language learners into a mutual appreciation of their cultures, their customs and rituals, dance, drama, literature, music, and so on. In order to foster intercultural understanding, singular and Tamil cultural centers will be established where learners will begin to appreciate not only the similarities, but more importantly, the differences between the two cultures. It is also hoped that provincial ministries of education will initiate language, single and Tamil teacher exchange programs between provinces with a view to enhancing cultural integration at school and community levels. In the exchange programs, visiting teachers should live in with families of different linguistic groups in the host villages to share cultural practices and enhance intercommunal understanding. Now, this task force is now in, is now in progress in the assessment of resources. There are already many government, semi-government, and non-governmental organizations, institutions that are engaged in the promotion of bilingual and trilingual skills. 
It is hoped that such a resource survey will help in employing short-term measures that are viable and fundable to improve the programs and activities already in progress. Because there are many, so many stakeholders in this matter. The Ministry of National Languages and Social Integration, for example, will be able to identify and coordinate with non-sector institutions involved in promoting the teaching of Sinhala and Tamil as a second language. Such a, such a survey will help the state to determine the depth of interventions required in the short term. The 10-year plan categorically states that the presidential task force will assist the process of modernizing language training and making inroads into researching, acquiring and incorporating up-to-date language technology such as e-learning and e-translation books, tools. It will organize and support conferences, seminars, and workshops organized to promote dialogue and debate on language development. It will also develop an e-learning course in Sinhala, Tamil and English languages, and software for e-translations between Sinhala, Tamil and English. One of the immediate concerns of the task force is the preparation of new teaching materials for Sinhala and Tamil. They will be prepared to serve different levels of competence. The initial step will be to make different from Tamil letters, the way they used to form syllables out of letters or sound has so much in common. You know the word pili. The use of pili, for example, the vowel strokes, very much similar to both Sinhala and Tamil. Now, if you have the sound O, you write a consonant, and in Sinhala, we put a kombu, K and ko. Tamil is the same thing. There's a ka, and there's a kombu in front. In fact, they call it kombu itself. So there are so many similar conventions of writing. So they can be taught easily. Of course, then, when they are when they taught how to speak Sinhala or Tamil, then more problems come up. Because, as you know, both Sinhala and Tamil have two varieties of language. One to speak, one to write. So we, the Sinhalese or Tamil speak in one way, but we write in a quite different way. So first, we want to teach them how to speak. Because most of the officers will, or children will want to speak first as part of their daily interpersonal communication. Right, writing in the written idiom will come next. In the third level, we'll teach them how to write in the written style, not the spoken idiom, but the written idiom, how to say that in Sinhala or Tamil. So, trilingual Sri Lanka, needless to say, is a highly ambitious venture. It's a challenge of the highest magnitude. As a linguistic teacher at the university, I'm fully aware of the immense problems we have come across in the teaching of English to undergraduates. The lack of qualified teachers of English was one of the most critical problems that we had to face. So teaching bilingual skills was very difficult. Now, that left much to be desired. Now, trilingual Sri Lanka will be a dream. However, it will not be a dream, but it can be realized if you place it on a war footing and set about in the right way so that all Sri Lankans can soon live in peace, harmony, and dignity. Thank you.